Hello and happy Friday. My name is John and I'm coming to you from the Vancouver Public Library in the Montalbano Family Theatre. The Vancouver Public Library is located on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil people and I am humbly glad to live, work and play on their land. Welcome to StoryStream, which is VPL's story time for adults. We aim to deliver fantastic short stories and to explore the lives of authors and their contributions to literature. Stories will be read by a variety of guests and VPL staff and will cover all genres of literature. We hope that you can sit back, relax and enjoy the program with a loved one. We'd like to offer a very special shout out to all of the seniors and their caregivers who tuned in to watch the original program Uncanny Tales. You can still view all episodes on the Uncanny Tales playlist on our YouTube channel. If you'd like a shout out, reach out to us using the program feedback form that's posted in the chat or by emailing us at programs at vpl.ca. Today, I will be reading Oh Ugly Bird by Manly Wade Wellman. The author was born in Kamandungo, Portuguese West Africa, which is now known as the People's Republic of Angola. His father was stationed there as a medical officer, and well, Manly Wade Wellman spoke the native dialect there before he ever learned to speak English. He became the adopted son of a powerful chief and uh, before his family moved to the United States. Wellman was a prolific writer, producing over 500 articles, novels, uh, stories, all between the 1920s and his death in 1986. He explored all genres, traversing between detective into Western, uh, fantasy to historical, science fiction to folklore, which is where today's story lies. A favorite location for Wellman uh, was the Appalachian Mountains, where today's story takes place. One of Wellman's most famous reoccurring protagonists in his story is John the Balladeer, a wandering backwoods musician with a silver string guitar. This is a classic Devil Be Gone story with charm and mystery, and I do hope that you will enjoy it. Today's story was selected from the big book of modern fantasy and can be found by following the link in the chat or by exploring the VPL catalog. Without further ado, I will now read Oh Ugly Bird by Manly Wade Wellman. Oh Ugly Bird. I swear I'm licked before I start trying to tell you all what Mr. Onslum looked like. Words give out sometimes, the way you're purely frozen to death for fit words to tell the favor of a girl you love. And Mr. Onslam and I, pure poison, hated each other from the start. That's the way love and hate are alike. He's what folks in the country call a low man, meaning he's short and small. But a low man is low other ways than in inches sometimes. Mr. Onslam's shoulders didn't wide out as far as his big ears, and they sank and they sagged. His thin legs bowed in at the knees, out at the shank, like two sickles put point to point. His neck was as thin as a carrot, and on it his head looked like a swollen up pale gourd. Thin hair, gray as tree moss, loose mouth, a little bit open to show long, straight teeth, not much chin. The right eye squinted, mean and dark, while the hike of his brow stretched the left one wide open. His good clothes fitted his mean body as if they were cut to its measure. Those good clothes of his were almost as much out of match to the rest of him as his long, soft, pink hands. The hands of a man who'd never had to work a tap's worth. You see now what I mean? I can't say just how he looked, only that he looked hateful. I first met him when I was coming down from that high mountain's comb along an animal trail. Maybe a deer made it. I was making to go on across the valley and through a pass onto Hark Mountain, where I'd heard tell was the bottomless pool. No special reason, just I had the notion to go there. The valley had trees in it, and through and among the trees I saw, here and there down the slope, patchy places and cabins and yards. I hoped to myself I might could get fed at one of the cabins, for I'd run clear out of eating some spell back. I didn't have any money, nary coin of it, just only my hickory shirt and blue jeans pants and torn old army shoes and my guitar and its sling cord. But I knew the mountain folks, if they've got anything to eat, a decent spoken stranger can get the half of it. Town folks ain't always the same way about that. 
Down the slope I picked my way, favoring the guitar just in case I slipped and fell down, and in an hour I'd made it to the first patch. The cabin was two rooms, dog-trotted and open through the middle. Beyond it was a shed and a pig pen, and the yard was the man of the house talking to who I found out later was Mr. Onslow. You don't have any meat at all? Mr. Onslow inquired him, and Mr. Onslow's voice was the last you'd expect his sort of man to have. It was full of broad, low music, like an organ in a big town church. But I decided not to ask him to sing when I'd taken another closer glimpse of him, sickle-legged and gourd-headed and pale and puny in his fine-fitting clothes. For small as he was, he looked mad and dangerous, and the man of the place, though he was big, strong-seeming old gentleman with a square jaw, looked scared. I had been right short this year, Mr. Onslam, he said, and it was a half-begging way, he said it. The last bit of meat I'd done fished out of the brine on Tuesday, and I'd sure rather not to kill the pig until December. Mr. Onslam tra tramped over to the pen and looked in. The pig was a friendly acting one. It reared up with its front feet against the boards and grunted up the way you'd know he'd hoped for something nice to eat. Mr. Onslam spit into the pen. All right, he said, granting a favor, but I want some meal. He sickle leg back down toward the cabin. A brown barrel stood out in the dog trot. Mr. Onslam flung off the cover and pinched up some meal between the tips of his pink fingers. Get me a sack, he told the man. The man went quick indoors and quick out he came with the sack. Mr. Onslam held it open while the man scooped out enough meal to fill it up. Then Mr. Onslam twisted the neck tight shut and the man lashed the neck with twine. Finally, Mr. Onslam looked up and saw me standing there with my guitar under my arm. Who are you? he asked, sort of crooning. Well, my name's John, I said. John what? Then he never waited for me to tell him John what. Where did you steal that guitar? Well, this was given to me, I replied to him. I strung it with the silver wires myself. Silver, said Mr. Onslam, and he opened his squint eye by a trifle bit. Well, yes, sir. With my left hand, I clamped a cord. With my right thumb, I picked the silver strings to a whisper. I began to make up a song. Mr. Onslam, they do what you tell them. That will do, said Mr. Onslam, not so sing-songingly, and I stopped with the half-made-up song. He relaxed and let his eye go back to a squint again. They do what I tell them, he said, halfway to himself. Hmm, not bad. We studied each other, he and I, for a few ticks of time. Then he turned away and went tramping out of the yard and off among the trees. When he was gone from sight, the man of the house asked me, right friendly enough, what he could do for me. Well, I'm just a-walking through, I said. I didn't want to ask him right off for some dinner. I heard you name yourself John, he said. Just so happens my name's John, too. John Bristow. Well, nice, nice place you got here, Mr. Bristow, I said, looking around. You cropping or are you renting? Well, I own the house and the land, he told me, and I was surprised, for Mr. Onslam had treated him the way a mean-minded boss treats a cropper. Oh, I said, then that Mr. Onslam was just a visitor? Visitor, Mr. Bristow snorted out the word. He visits every living soul here around, lets them know what thing he wants, and they pass it to him. I kindly, I thought, kindly thought you knew him. You sang about him so ready. Oh, I just got that up. I touched the silver strings again. Many a new song comes to me, and I just sing it. That's my nature. Mm. I love the old songs better, said Mr. Bristow, and smiled. So I sang one. I had been in Georgia, not a many more weeks than three, when I fell in love with a pretty fair girl, and she fell in love with me. Her lips were red as red could be, her eyes were brown as brown, her hair was like a thundercloud before the rain comes down. Gentlemen, you'd ought to have been there to see Mr. Bristow's face shine. He said, by God, John, you sure enough can sing it and play it. It's a pure pleasure to hark at you. Well, I do my possible best, I said, but Mr. Onslam doesn't like it. I thought for a moment, then I inquired him. What's the way he can get every thing he wants in the valley? Shoo, can't tell you just that way. Just done it for years he has. Doesn't anybody refuse him? Well, it's happened. Once, they say, old Jim Desbro refused him a chicken, and Mr. Onslow pointed his finger at Jim's mules. 
They was a plowing at the time. Them mules couldn't move nary a hoof until Mr. Onslam had the chicken from old Jim. Another time there was Miss Tilly Parmer. Hit a cake she just baked when she seen Mr. Onslam a coming. He pointed a finger and he dumbed her. He, she never spoke one mumbling word from that day on to the day she laid down and died. Could hear and know what was said to her, but when she tried to talk, she could only just gibble. Mm. Then he's a hoodoo man, I said, and that means the law can't do a thing to him. No, sir, not even if the law worried itself up about anything going to this far from the country seat. He looked at the meal sack, still standing in the dog trot. You're about time for the ugly bird to come fetch Mr. Onslam's meal. Ooh, what's the ugly bird, I asked, but Mr. Bristow didn't have time to tell me. It must have been a hanging up there over us, high and quiet, and now it dropped down into the yard like a fish hawk into a pond. First out, I could see it was dark, heavy-winged, bigger by right than buzzer. Then I made out the shiny gray-black of the body, like wet slate, and how the body looked to, to be naked, how it seemed there were feathers only on the wide wings. Then I saw the long, thin, snaky neck and the bulgy head and the long, crane beak. And I saw the two eyes set in front of the head, set man fashion in the front, not bird fashion, one on each side. The feet grabbed for the sack and taloned onto it, and they showed pink and smooth, with five grabby toes on each one. Then the wings snapped like a tablecloth in a high wind, and it went churning up again and away over the tops of the trees, taking the sack of meal with it. That's the ugly bird, said Mr. Bristow to me, so low I could just about hear him. Mr. Onslam been, Onslam's been companioning with it ever since I could re recollect. Such a sh sort of bird I never saw before, I said. Must be a right scared out one. Do you know what it struck me while I was watching it? Most likely I do know, John. It's got feet look like Mr. Onslam's hands. Could it maybe be, I asked, that a hoodoo man like Mr. Onslam knows what way to shape himself into a bird thing? But Mr. Bristow shook his gray head. It's known that when he's at one place, the ugly bird's been sighted at another. He tried to change the subject. Silver strings on your guitar. I never heard tell of aught but steel strings. Well, in the olden days, I told him, silver was used many times for strings. It gives a more singy sound. In my mind, I had it made sure that the subject wasn't going to be changed. I tried a chord on my guitar and began to sing. You all have heard of the ugly bird, so curious and queer. It flies its flight by day and night, and it fills folks' hearts with fear. John, Mr. Bristow began to butt in, but I sang on. I never came here to hide from fear, and I gave you my promise word that I soon expect to twist the neck of the goddamn ugly bird. Mr. Bristow looked sick at me. His hand trembled as it felt in his pocket. I wish I could bid you stop and eat with me, he said. But here, maybe you better buy you something. What he gave me was a quarter and a dime. I near about gave them back, but I saw he wanted me to have them. So I thanked him kindly and walked off down the same trail through the trees Mr. Onslam had gone. Mr. Bristow watched me go, looking shrunk up. Why had my song scared him? I kept singing it. Oh, ugly bird, oh, ugly bird, you spy and sneak and thief. This place can't be for you and me, and one of us got to leave. Singing, I tried to recollect all I'd heard or read or guessed that might could help towards studying out what the ugly bird was. Didn't witch folks have partner animals? I'd read and I'd heard tell about the animals called familiars. Mostly they were cats or black dogs or such matter as that, but sometimes they were birds. That might could be the secret, or right much of it, for the ugly bird wasn't Mr. Onslam, Onslam, changed by witching so he could fly. Mr. Bristow had said that the two of them were seen different places at one and the same time, so Mr. Onslam could no way turn himself into the ugly bird. They were close partners, no more, brothers, with the ugly bird's feet looking like Mr. Onslam's pink hands. I was aware of something up in the sky, the big black V of something that flew. It quartered over me half as high as the highest scrap of woolly white cloud. Once or twice it made a turn, seemingly like wanting to stoop for me like a hawk for a rabbit, but it didn't do any such thing. Looking up at it and letting my feet find the trail on their own way, I rounded a bunch of mountain laurel and there on a rotten log in the middle of a clearing sat Mr. Onslow. 
His gored head was sunk down on his thin neck. His elbows set on his crooked knees and the soft, pink, long hands hid his face as if he felt miserable. The look of him made me feel disgusted. I came walking close to him. You don't feel so brash, do you? I asked him. Go away, he sort of gulped, soft and tired and sick. What for? I wanted to know. I like it here. Sitting on the log next to him, I pulled my guitar across me. I feel like singing, Mr. Onslum. I made it up again, word by word, as I sang it. His father got hung for a hog sealing, his mother got burned for a witch, and his only friend is the ugly bird, the dirty son. Something hit me with a shoot like a shooting star, a slamming down from overhead. It hit my back and shoulder, and it knocked me floundering forward on one hand and one knee. It was only the mercy of God I didn't fall on my guitar and smash it. I crawled forward, a few quick scrambles, and made to get up again, shaky and dizzy to see what had happened. I saw. The ugly bird had flown down and dropped the sack of meal on me. Now it skimmed across the clearing at the height of the low branches. Its eyes glinted at me, and its mouth came open like a pair of scissors. I saw teeth, sharp and mean like the teeth of agarfish. Then the ugly bird swooped for me, and the wind of its wings was colder than a winter tempest storm. Without thinking or stopping to think, I flung up both my hands to box it off from me, and it gave back. It flew back from me like the biggest, devilishest hummingbird you've ever seen in a nightmare. I was too dizzy and scared to wonder why it had pulled off like that. I had barely the wit to be glad it did. Get out of here, moaned Mr. Oslem, not stirring from where he sat. I take shame to say, I got. I kept my hands up and backed across the clearing into the trail on the far side. Then I halfway thought I knew where my luck had come from. My hands had lifted my guitar up as the ugly bird flung itself at me, and some way it hadn't liked the guitar. Reaching the trail again, I looked back. The ugly bird was perching on the log where I'd been sitting. It staunched along close to Mr. Onslum, sort of nuzzling up to him. Horrible to see, I'll be sworn. They were sure enough close together. I turned and stumbled off away along the trail down the valley and off toward the pass beyond the valley. I found a stream with stones making steps across it. I followed it down to where it made a wide pool. There I got on my knee and washed my face. It looked pale as clabber in the water image and sat down on my back to a tree and hugged my guitar and had a rest. I was shaking all over. I must have felt near about as bad for a while as Mr. Onslem had looked to feel, sitting on that rotten log to wait for his ugly bird. And what else? Had he been hungry near to death? Sick? Or maybe had his own evil set back on him? I couldn't rightly say which. But after a while, I felt some better. I got up and walked back to the trail and along it again till I came to what must have been the only store thereabouts. It faced one way on a rough gravelly road that could carry wagon traffic, car traffic too if you didn't mind your car getting a good shake up, and the trail joined on there right across from the doorway. The building wasn't big, but it was good, made of sawed planks, and there was paint on it, well painted on. Its bottom rested on big rocks instead of posts, and it had a roofed open front like a porch with a bench in there where folks could sit. Opening the door, I went in. You'll find many such stores in backcountry places through the land where folks haven't built their towns up too close. Two, three counters, shelves of cans and packages, smoked meat hung up in one corner, a glass-fronted icebox for fresh meat in another, barrels here and there for beans or meal or potatoes, at the end of one counter, a sign says U.S. Post Office, and there's a set of maybe half a dozen pigeonholes to put letters in, and a couple of cigar boxes for stamps and money order blanks. That's the kind of place it was. The propri proprietor wasn't in just then, only a girl, scared and shaky back of the counter, and Mr. Onslum, there ahead of me, a telling her what it was that he wanted. He wanted her. I don't care a shuck if Sam Heaver did leave you in charge here, he said with the music in his voice. He won't stop my taking you with me. Then he heard me come in and he swung round and fixed his squint eye and his wide open eye on me like two mismatched gun muscles. <sighs> you again, he said. He looked right hale and hearty again. I strayed my hand over the guitar's silver strings just enough to hear and he twisted up his face as if it colicked him. 
Winnie, he told the girl, wait on this stranger and get him out of here. Her round eyes were scared in her scared face. I thought inside myself that seldom I'd seen such a sweet face as hers or as scared of one. Her hair was dark and thick. It was like the thunder cloud before the rain comes down. It made her paleness look paler. She was small and slim, and she cowered there for fear of Mr. Onslam and what he'd been saying to her. Yes, sir, she said to me, hushed and shaky. A box of crackers, please, ma'am, I decided, pointing to where they were on the shelf behind her, and a can of those little sardine fish. She put them on the counter for me. I dug out the quarter Mr. Bristow had given me up the trail and slapped it down in the countertop between the scared girl and Mr. Onslow. Get away, he squeaked, shrill and sharp and mean as a bat. When I looked at him, he jumped back, almost halfway across the floor from the counter. And for just once, both his eyes were big and wide. Why, Mr. Onslow, what's the matter? I wondered him, and I purely was wondering. This is a good quarter. I picked it up and held it out for him to take and study. But he flung himself around and he ran out of that store like a rabbit, a rabbit with dogs running it down. The girl he'd call Winnie was just leaned against the wall as if she was bone tired. I asked her, why did he light out like that? I gave her the quarter and she shook it. That money isn't a scary thing, is it? I asked. It doesn't much scare me, she said, and rang it up on the old cash register. All that scares me is... Mr. Onslow. I picked up the box of crackers and sardines. Is he courting you? She shivered, although it was warm in the store. I'd sooner be in a hole with a snake than be courted by Mr. Onslow. Then why not just tell him to leave you be? He wouldn't hark at that, she said. He always just does what pleases him. Nobody dares to stop him. So I've heard tell, I nodded, about the mules he stopped where they stood and the poor old lady he struck dumb. I returned to the thing we'd been talking. But what made him squinch away from that money piece? I'd reckon he'd love money. She shook her head and the thundercloud hair stirred. Mr. Onslow never needs any money. He takes what he wants without paying for it. Including you, I asked. Not including me yet. She shuddered again. He reckons to do that later on. I put down my dime I had left from what Mr. Bristow had gifted me. Let's have a Coke drink together, you and me. She rang up the dime, too. There was a sort of dried-out chuckle at the door, like a stone flung rattling down a deep, dark well. I looked quick, and I saw two long, dark wings flop away outside. The ugly bird had come to spy what we were doing. But the girl Winnie hadn't seen, and she smiled over her Coke drink. I asked her permission to open my fish and crackers on the bench outside. She said I could. Out there, I worried open the can with the little key that comes with it, and I had my meal. When I'd finished, I put the empty can in the cracker box in a garbage barrel and tuned my guitar. Hearing that, Winnie came out. She told me how to make my way to the pass and on beyond to Hark Mountain. Of the bottomless pool, she'd heard some talk, although she'd never been there to see it. There she harked while I picked the music and I sang a song about a girl whose hair was like a thundercloud before the rain comes down. Harking, Winnie blushed till she was pale no more. Then we talked about Mr. Onslow and the ugly bird and how they had been seen in two different places at one, at one time. But, said Winnie, nobody's ever seen the two of them together. I have, I told her, and not an hour back. And I related about how Mr. Onslow had sat all sick and miserable on that rotten log and how the ugly bird had lighted beside him and crowded up to him. She was quiet to hear all about it, with her eyes staring off the way she might be looking for something far away. When I was done, she said, John, you tell me it crowded right up next to him? It did that thing, I said again. You'd think it was studying how to crawl right inside of him. Inside him? That's a true fact. She kept staring off and thinking. Makes me recollect something I heard somebody say once about hoodoo folks, she said, after a time. How there's hoodoo folks can sometimes put a sort of stuff up, mostly in a dark room. And the stuff is part of them, but it can take the shape and mind of some other person. And once in a while, the shape and mind of an animal. Shoo, I said. Now you mention it, I've heard some talk of the same thing. And somebody reckoned it might could explain those Louisiana stories about the werewolves. The shape and mind of an animal, she repeated herself. Maybe the shape and mind of a bird and... And that stuff they call it, uh, echo, uh, no, ecto, ecto. 
ectoplasm, I said. I remembered the word. That's it. I've even seen a book with pictures in it. They say that we're taken with such stuff, and it seems to be alive. It'll yell if you grab it or hit it or stab it or anything like that. Couldn't maybe, Winnie began, but a musical voice interrupted him. I say, he's been around here long enough, Mr. Onslam was telling somebody. Back he came. Behind him were three men. Mr. Bristow was one, and there was likewise a tall, gawky man with wide shoulders and a black, stubby chin, and behind him a soft, smooth, grizzled old man with an old, fancy vest over his white shirt. Mr. Onslam was like the leader of a posse. Sam Heaver, he crooned at the soft, grizzled one. Do you favor having tramps come and loaf around your store? The soft old storekeeper looked at me, dead and gloomy. You better get going, son, he said, as if he'd memorized it. I laid my guitar on the bench beside me, very careful of it. You men ale my stomach, I said, looking at them from one to the next to the next. You come at the whistle of this half-born, half-bred witch man. You let him sick you on me like dogs when I'm hurting nobody and nothing. Better go, said the old storekeeper again. I stood up and faced Mr. Onslam, ready to fight him. He just laughed at me like a sweet, sweetly playing horn. You, he said, without a dime in your pocket. What are you a feathering up about? You can't do anything to anybody. Without a dime. But I'd had a dime. I'd spent it for the coat drinks for Winnie and me, and the ugly bird had spied in to see me spend it, my silver money. The silver money that scared and ailed Mr. Onslam. Take his guitar home, Mr. Onslam said in order, and the gawky man moved, clumsy but quick, and grabbed my guitar off the bench and backed away to the inner door. There, said Mr. Onslam, sort of purring, that takes care of him. He fairly jumped too, and grabbed Winnie by her wrist. He pulled her along out of the porch toward the trail, and I heard her whimper. Stop him, I yelled out, but the three of them stood and looked, scared to move or say a word. Mr. Onslam, still holding Winnie with one hand, faced me. He lifted his other hand and stuck out the pink forefinger at me like the barrel of a pistol. Just the look his two eyes, squint and wide, gave me weary and dizzy to my bones. He was going to witch me as he'd done the mules, and he, as he'd done to the woman who tried to hide her cake from him. I turned away from his gaze, sick and sure I was afraid. And I heard him giggle, thinking he'd won already. I took a step, and I was next to that gawky fellow named Hobe, who held my guitar. I made a quick, long jump and started to wrestle it away from him. Hang on to that thing, Hobe, I heard Mr. Onslam sort of choke out. And from Mr. Bristow, take care, there's the ugly bird. Its big, dark wings flapped like a storm in the air just behind me. But I'd shoved my elbow into Hobe's belly pit, and I'd torn my guitar from his hands, and I turned on my heel to face what was being brought upon me. A little way off in the open, Mr. Onslam stood stiff and straight as a stone figure in front of an old courthouse. He still held Winnie by the wrist. Right betwixt them came a swooping the ugly bird at me, the ugliest ugly of all, its long, sharp beak pointing for me like a sticky knife. I dug my toes and smashed my guitar at it. I swung the way a player swings a ball bat at a pitched ball. Full slam, I struck its bulgy head right above that sharp beak and across its two eyes, and I heard the loud noise as the polished wood of my music maker crashed to splinters. Oh, gentlemen, and down went that ugly bird. Down it went, falling just short of the porch. Quiet it lay. Its great big feathered wings stretched out either side without any flutter to them. Its beak was driven into the ground like a nail. It didn't kick or flop or stir once. But Mr. Onslam, where he stood holding Winnie, screamed out the way he might scream if something had crawled out all of his insides with one single tearing, digging grab. He didn't move. I don't even know if his mouth came rightly open to make that scream. Winnie gave a pull with all the strength she had and taught it back loose from him. Then, as if only his hold on her had kept him standing, Mr. Onslam slapped right over and dropped down on his face, his arms flung out like the ugly bird's wings, his face in the dirt like the ugly bird's face. Still holding on to my broken guitar by the neck like a club, I walked quick over to him and stooped. Get up, I bade him and took hold of what hair he had and lifted up his face to look at it. One look was a plenty. From the war, I know a dead man when I see one. I let go of Mr. Onslam's hair and his face went back into the dirt the way you'd known it belonged there. 
The other men moved at last, slow and tottery like old men, and they didn't act like my enemies now, for Mr. Onslow, who'd made them act that way, was down and dead. Then Hogue gave a sort of shaky, scared shout, and we looked where he was looking. The ugly bird looked all of a sudden rotten and mushy, and while we saw it, it was soaking into the ground. To me, anybody, its body had seemed to turn shadowy and misty, and I could see through it to pebbles on the ground beneath. I moved close, though I didn't relish moving. The ugly bird was melting away like dirty snow on top of a hot stove, only no wetness left behind. It was gone while we watched and wondered and felt bad all over, and at the same time, glad to see it go. Nothing left but the hole punched in the dirt by its beak. I stepped closer yet, and with my shoe, I stamped that hole shut. Then Mr. Bristow kneeled on his, kneeled on his knee and turned Mr. Onslam over. On the dead face ran lines across, thin and purple, as though he'd been struck down by a blow from a toaster or a gridiron. Why, said Mr. Bristow, why, John, them's the marks of your guitar strings. He looked up at me. Your silver guitar strings. Silver, said the storekeeper. Is them strings silver? Why, friend, silver finishes a hoodoo man. That was it. All of us remembered that at once. Sure enough, put in Hobe, ain't it a silver bullet that t takes a witch to kill? Or hang in a burning? And a silver knife to kill a witch's cat? And a silver key locks out ghosts, don't it? Said Mr. Bristow, getting up to stand among us again. I looked at my broken guitar and the dangling strings of silver. What was the word you said when he whispered to me? Ectoplasm, I replied to her. Like his soul coming out of him and getting itself struck dead outside of his body. Then there was talk, more important, about what to do now. The men did the deciding. They allowed the report to the country seat that Mr. Onslam's heart had stopped on him, which was what it had done after all. They went over to the tale three or four times to make sure they'd all tell it the same. They cheered up when they talked it. You could never call for a bunch of gladder folks to get shed of a neighbor. Then they tried to say their thanks to me. John, said Mr. Bristow, we'd all of us sure enough be proud and happy if you'd stay here. You took his curse off us, and we can't never thank you enough. Don't thank me, I said. I was fighting for my life. Hope said he wanted to come live with he wanted me to come live with him on his farm and help him work it on half shares. Sam Heaver offered me all the money he had in his old cash register. I thanked them. To each I said, No, sir, thank you kindly. I'd better not. If they wanted their tale to sound true to the sheriff, and the coroner, they'd better help it along by forgetting that I'd never been around when Mr. Onslam's heart stopped pumping. Anyhow, I meant to go look at that bottomless pool. All I was truly sorry about was my guitar had got broken. But while I was saying all that, Mr. Bristow had gone off running. Now he came back with a guitar he'd had at his place, and he said that he'd be honored if I'd take it instead of mine. It was a good guitar, had a fine tone. So I put my silver strings on it and tightened and tuned them and tried a quarter two. Winnie swore by all that was pure and holy she'd pray for me by name each night of her life, and I told her that would be sure enough to see me safe from any assault of the devil. Assault of the devil, John, she said, almost shrill in the voice she meant it so truly. It's been you who drove the devil from out of this valley. And the others all said they agreed her on that. It was foretold about you in the Bible, said Winnie, her voice soft again. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John, but that was far too much for her to say, and she dropped her sweet dark head down, and I saw her mouth tremble and two tears sneak down around her cheek, and I was abashed. I said goodbye all around in a hurry. Off I walked toward where the pass would be, strumming my new guitar as I walked. Back into my mind, I got an old, old song I've heard tell that's written down in an old, tiny book called Percy's Frolics or Relics or some such name. Lady, I never loved witchcraft, never dealt in privy wild, but evermore held the highway of love and honor free from guile. And though I couldn't bring myself to look back yonder to the place I was leaving forever, I knew that Winnie was watching me and that she listened, listened till she had to strain her ears to catch the last, faintest end of my song. The End